morning, everybody, and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I'm Tom Vassell, and we are glad you're here. I'm excited for several reasons. The first of all is we just came off a of virtual con, and it was fantastic. I look forward to doing future things like that. Obviously, a virtual convention is in no way as good as a live convention, but huzzah, they are still a lot of fun. And for those of you I played games with, and I know lots of people play games with each other, I hope you had a great time. Secondly, this is the week of the Dice Tower Summer Spectacular. And really, we put a lot of work into this, and we really hope you enjoy it. It is starting on Tuesday, so most of our regular programming is not happening this week uh, with reviews and such, but we are going to be putting out the Dice Tower Summer Spectacular, which is going to be full of live games, um, interviews with different publishers, um, playthroughs of things going on from our, all the different contributors. The Dice Tower have jumped in and sent in all kinds of stuff, and five top tens. So we got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, five top tens coming up for you. So I hope that you enjoy that we have some special guests you can see the whole lineup we'll have a link in the description below to the lineup of all the videos coming out so we hope you come and if I haven't mentioned there's gonna be uh, about 90 games given out over the course of this as to people watching live now if you're not watching live and you're like I still want to win something good news this episode is sponsored by Pandasaurus and today we're talking about Sonara Sonara is the world's first flick and write game so you like crocodile you like flicking things you like roll and writes where you write down things? This combines them. In this game, you flick discs onto a board. You will then use where your discs land to write on this already laminated piece of paper that has four different sections. In each section, you're trying to score points in various ways. One section you're putting shapes on. Another section you are moving down, trying to enclose triangles. So it has a mixture of that dexterity with that. And we're giving out three copies of that. Now, this is for North America only this time, but this contest lasts all week long. We'll announce the winners next week in our board game breakfast. All you have to do to enter is email us at contest at dicetower.com, and in the subject line, put flick, F-L-I-C-K. That's all you got to do, and your address in the body, and we will announce the winners next week. Alrighty, so we have that with Summer Spectacular. I'm very excited. Let's get going. Today, for what I found on the internet, I'm actually talking about a Kickstarter. Now, this is no, uh, nothing here that the Dice Tower has been paid to do. This is just a Kickstarter that I thought was very interesting. There is a board game Facebook group. It is called Board Game Art Creations. And Katya uh, is someone who takes pieces from board games and creates mosaics with them. Now, this has been done by multiple people, but her stuff, I feel, is amazing. And so she has a Kickstarter going right now, and we'll have a link in the description below where you can go and get a calendar with these made from it and this is something that as soon as I saw it I really liked it I want to get the dice tower done this way the logo and stuff and I was just really impressed with this this is a small thing right I love art but I love collages of things. I love collages of board game pieces. In fact, for our board game group, the Miami Board Gamers, years ago, before I even met him, Z Garcia made the, the name of it with pieces and stuff. And uh, that we still use it as the logo for the, our group now. It's neat, but this stuff is on another level. So there's not a whole lot more for me to talk about here other than to say I really like this. I just thought it would be something that I wanted to give this kind of a signal boost. It's really cool. So if you think this sort of thing is neat check the link below you can see her art on her Facebook page and then of course back the Kickstarter if you find it as interesting as I do so that's what I found that I thought was really fascinating this week hi everybody I'm Starla I'm Mick and we are our, our favorite, favorite games. games and today we're gonna talk to you about another one of our favorite family games Restoration Games Downforce. Downforce. Yeah. Now, Two to six players now. Now, Downforce is a racing game, as you can tell, with all the cute little cars oh, yeah. that are on the board. Oh, yeah. And what you do first, you have to auction to get your driver. By using these cool cards yes. that have all the 
colors, colors. On, the, on the card. Now, not all of them at the same time, but a few that's according to the cards. Because you got to use this card to move these cards around. Yes. But you also use it to get the card that you want. And then you also, in addition to getting a driver, you get some special power cards. Let you do some wild and crazy stuff. Let you do some extra things yeah. when you're around, yeah. going around the track. So that's what helps you win the game. So as you cross the yellow lines, those are your betting lines. Mm -hmm. Now you have this little pad here. It'll tell you everything you need to do. It shows you where to put your auction information, where to put your betting information, and how to add up everything at the end of the game. So your goal, of course, is to get your driver in first place. But also, if you can't get your driver in first place, you might can try to push your opponent in there while you're betting, saying, hey, yeah. I think even though I'm red, Yellow, I'm gonna try to push them a little head. You know, you can yeah, do those. Yeah, you don't let them know you're betting on them. Yeah, you know, yeah. so that's what makes this game so much fun. I just love it. And you have six players. You got all the beautiful colors. That's a family and game. Yeah. This is a double sided board. Yeah, double sided. Yeah. Double sided. <laughs> and then they got a whole bunch of other maps you can get they to do. now. They yeah, do. and we've yeah. got a couple more different. Maps yeah, we do. We do. We love down. Yeah, we love. So if we you got it. teenagers or young people in the house, this is a fun, quick game. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's it. it. That's, that's it. it. Hey. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a good breakfast, y'all. Bye bye. I'm always looking for things I can watch with my family. There's a lot of new content out there that's streaming, which is just not appropriate for families at all. Um, I heard about this game show here called The Floor is Lava. I mean, which of us haven't played it as a child? My kids have. I have. My wife said she didn't, which was odd. But anyhow, uh, yeah, you know, you try not to touch the floor because the floor is lava. So this game show has this ridiculous premise where people need to get across a room that is filled with lava and they play it straight. They never once say, well, it's not actually lava. You know, so the game is really dorky to the point where if someone falls in the lava, they apparently tell them to completely submerge and everyone else on their team shouts, no, in extremely cheesy ways. But it is a very entertaining show. I don't know what it is. There's this continual, as you watch them try to figure out across the room, you're like, I would have done that. Definitely, there's some Freud as you watch some, some people try some really ridiculous jumps and things. And when they fall, the, this game show does not hesitate to show you that fall from 25 different angles uh, and with amusing music and what have you. So if you like that, and my kids and I do. But we also try to figure out what's the best way to go. And we cheer for teams that aren't too cocky. Uh, we cheer for teams that seem like they're working together. And they're teams of three people. And whoever gets the most people across win. And if there's a tie, um, there often is, then whoever does it faster wins. And so if you're just looking for some entertaining, light, family fun, uh, there's a lot of stupid game shows out there. There really is. Game shows are a dime a dozen at this point in time. And I, and I usually watch one and I go, eh, I'm using and move on. This one has kept me going to we're watching through the whole season of it. So I like this show a lot. It's called The Floor is Lava. Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, well, today we're talking about Sheriff of Nottingham. In this game, what you're trying to do is you have all these illegal goods and illegal contraband goods that you are trying to smuggle into the town of Nottingham. Um, there's the sheriff who's going to inspect your bags, maybe. If he finds anything he shouldn't find, uh, you're going to get fined for it. Find, find... Interesting. All right. <laughs> but if he checks you and you are, you know, legitimate, he has to pay you money for the hassle, I guess. So, uh, yeah, no, this is a lot of fun. It's a very social game. Uh, but what I've been finding in my life is I've got to take <laughs> take in less of the, the illegal contraband goods. <laughs> I've been trying to smuggle in a lot of unnecessary food into my diet, if you know what I mean. So, um, something I've identified, and I'm going to start working on it a little bit better, or even better. So this isn't a social deduction game, but it is a huge social game. Who you play with really is going to determine how much fun you have with this game. Oh, yeah. um, if people are not bargaining with each other, if they're not trying to do anything fun with it or trying to get more apples when you have apples to try to do stuff, it's just not going to be nearly as exciting. And also, it is possible to win this game without lying or smuggling anything in. However, 
However, the Merry Men's expansion kind of removes that. Like you have to smuggle things in in order to win. And I think there are some elements of that that are going into the re-release. Yeah, there's a second edition that's coming out. Um, not a whole lot has been released about it yet, but it sounds like it's going to be a whole lot of fun. All right, so we're probably going to stick with our original first edition with the Merry Men expansion for now. Uh, but we've been having a whole lot of fun with this. It's just, it's so easy to teach and it's a whole lot of fun. All right, everybody, if you want to hear our full thoughts, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. We are Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, everybody, this is Ryan. I'm Bethany, hoping you have a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Hi folks, I'm Andy from Portable Gaming and this is Change of Venue, a segment where I talk about board game IPs I love as board games, but would equally like to see in different mediums. Today I want to talk about Wasteland Express Delivery Service. Now Wasteland Express Delivery Service is a fantastic pick up and deliver game by Pandasaurus Games. It was set in a post-apocalypse where you and your fellow players, all player members of the titular Wasteland Express Delivery Service, completing different missions to try and earn money to upgrade your vehicles meet contracts and hopefully complete the three priority contracts that mean you win the game. This is a beautifully realised world with fantastic art and great sense of humour and it's one you can just immerse yourself in. In fact there's very few board games that have immersed me as much as Wasteland Express Delivery Service including the time I played a game with a friend once who got upset that we ended the game because he was just so happy to inhabit that world. So part of that leads me to think that it could be fun to turn it into a video game, having it as an actual delivery game, something akin to Death Stranding but with a lot more of the sense of humour and the wild visual aesthetic of something like Rage and the Mad Max life that you kind of want from that, more vehicle combat, it could be a really interesting experience. But that's not where I really want to see it happen. Where I really want to see it happen is the world of comic books. So the reason I was interested in this game in the first place was because the art was done by Riccardo Bocelli, who was a fantastic comic book artist responsible for one of my favourite comic book series of all time, DMZ, in America after a second civil war. And it's a fantastic comic book, it is smart, it is funny, it is interesting, and the art is brilliant. And I want to see Wasteland Express Delivery Service brought life that way. I want Ricardo to pick up the pen and draw those characters and show me the world that they live in in more detail. There is so much flavour, there is so much story, there is so much campaign work within the box of Wasteland Express Delivery Service that I want to know more of. And I feel having it in a proper monthly comic book series could be a fantastic experience. Anyway, what do you think folks? Would you read that comic? Would you play that game? Do you have any games you want me to cover? Please let me know down in the comments below. As always, I've been Andy. And it's your round. So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, the answer is pretty simple. The Dice Tower Summer Spectacular. Now, like I said, we have a whole schedule which you'll be able to see below and learn about. But I did want to specifically mention our top 10 lists. So the first top 10 list that we're doing on Tuesday is our top 10 board game apps. We're doing this with, I'm doing it with uh, Eric and Mandy and Suzanne from the Dice Hour Podcast. This is something that you've noticed on the channel I've been doing more of, so I'm catching up to them. They're much bigger experts than I am on this sort of thing, but hopefully you enjoy that. Then Paula Deming and Crystal Pisano are joining me and Z, and we're going to talk about games from 10 years ago. So this is 2020. We're going to talk about the best games from 2010, which games have stood the test of time. Then we're being joined by the folks from No Pun Included, um, Elaine and Efka, and we're going to be just talking and you know, kind of jawing about our top 10 convention experiences, and I hope that you uh, enjoy that as we sit there and remember some really cool things that have happened to us. In a year with no conventions, sometimes it's fun to look back at what's happened in the past. Um, and then the folks from Our Family Play Board Games, which you may have seen on Good Morning America, they're joining us to talk about well, our favorite family games. We're excited about that. And then finally, the last one on July 4th, Independence Day, uh, Sam Healy is coming back to join me and Z for a top 10 list that Sam picked from a thing, our top 10 pick up and deliver games. Are they going to be Viking themed? Will Bang the Dice Game make the list? We'll have to find out. So we're doing all that stuff. I hope you enjoy that, but I hope you enjoy everything else. We'll be shutting down at our final list with Sam will be the last thing we do. That will end around 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on Saturday. And then we're going to shut down the rest of that day because eh, we want to spend time with our families on this holiday. And then we'll take, uh, we're going to be taking a little bit of time off from that to kind of relax because we're putting out a lot of content here. But for a while here, there's going to be a ton of content, and I hope you enjoy it, so stay tuned this week. Hey there, everyone. It's Jen, the board game librarian, and I'm joined by... Uh, Matt, the dice chucker. I'm also Jen's husband. 
All right, uh, so we are here to talk about Stormlight Archive. So I brought Matt on to talk probably mostly this segment about um, Cult of Adventure Stormlight Archive and the Brandon Sanderson books because I have not read the books. Okay. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to take a look at the Stormlight Archive, uh, just a bit of a heads up, it's a very complex, very heavy fantasy series written by the master himself, Brandon Sanderson. If you haven't read any of Sanderson's work, I highly suggest it. Uh, he is the master, I think, in my opinion, of fantasy. There's so much going on in, in Stormlight Archive. He plans to have this series reach ten books in two separate cycles of five. They're all about a thousand pages each. These characters just jump off the page and they grab you. Now, when Call to Adventure came out last year, I enjoyed it. Uh, but I felt that it was, once again, generic fantasy. And then I heard that they were implementing Stormlight Archive into this, and they did it very well. Uh, not only do you, can you play Call to Adventure as normal, but you can also play uh, as co-op. And you're playing against Odium, uh, one of the uh, forces to be reckoned with in the Stormlight Archive. And everything you do can either strengthen him or weaken him. So, uh, and there's no endgame scoring at the end of a co-op game of Call to Adventure. So, if you were hoping for that little bit extra in the game last time, definitely pick up Stormlight Archive. Uh, that version of Call to Adventure, it really brought the game to life for me, but it also, phenomenal artwork, and um, just kind of gave me another layer of Stormlight Archive. Um, we'll see you next week. Happy breakfast. Bye, everybody. Hey everyone, it's Anna Maria from Girls Game Shelf. I hope that you've been able to get outside a little bit lately and enjoy our early summer weather. Unfortunately, in my area of the country, that means a lot of rainstorms. So we've actually been spending a little bit more time indoors than we had been previously. And that means playing family games. Now, the one kind of drawback to that is everyone in the family kind of has their favorites and their strengths, so we don't always agree on what we want to bring to the table. But lately we've been compromising on dexterity games because no one in my family is actually really fantastic with them. So today I wanted to share with you all three games that have been making it to the table a lot more lately that we've really been enjoying. So first on our list is Go Cuckoo, and I really don't care how old you are, the act of playing reverse pickup sticks in this adorable little Hava game is fantastic. It has a little tin that actually acts as your game board, which I think is super cool. And then trying to create this nest and balance eggs on top of it is fun for pretty much everyone, no matter whether or not they're a kid or a kid at heart. Next up is Ice Cool, which is kind of an ode to every game of paper football I ever played in middle school. In addition to it being like really super fun to just flick the little penguins around, I love the efficiency of the box, which stacks and then unstacks, clips together, and becomes your playing surface, which I just think is beautifully efficient design. And finally, there's Junk Art, which is actually my personal favorite dexterity game because there's a lot of different modes in this one. So instead of just being kind of a basic, here's a bunch of shapes and let's stack them up, you may have to play cooperative for a round. You may have to have someone else pick your pieces for you. You may have to arrange them in a certain order to match things. So I really appreciate the variety that comes with a box that's just 60 random pieces and then tells you what you have to do for this round. So that's the three stacking, flicking, and pulling games that we've been bringing to our table a lot lately. If you have a favorite dexterity game in your family, drop it in the comments below so I can check it out. Be sure to check us out on Girls Game Shelf. Have a fantastic week, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Hey folks, today I'm going to talk a little inside baseball, but it's, uh, it's, 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 it's something that definitely affects us here in the industry, and that is embargo dates. Now this was something that really didn't exist about 10 years ago. You reviewed a game or you didn't review a game, but now a lot of publishers will put an embargo date. They'll send you the game and they'll say, don't review it until this point in time. Um, in fact, one company 
uh, said don't you need to review it in this time frame uh, but most of the time they say don't review it till June 3rd June 6th whatever in fact a very good example of that just last week there was an embargo date on Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion um, so an embargo dates an interesting thing most companies uh, do not care um, enough to make you sign an NDA although just I just literally signed one yesterday with a fairly large company but that is the exception to the rule right uh, most of the time uh, they they send you these they say don't review it to this date and you're probably everyone's gonna follow the rules right if you don't follow an embargo you're like ha 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 I'll get the review out early well then you'll pay for that because that company will probably never send you another review um, and I don't think uh, embargo dates uh, I know a couple in the past have been definitely uh, accidentally spoiled in fact there's one where myself I did it by accident clearly by accident and I worked it out with the company um, but for the most part people are going to follow those so what happens with when you embargo a game it a lot of things depend on the game's popularity someone had mentioned to me what if every company embargoes games well it wouldn't really change reviewing it would only change the reviews for the big releases there's no question that Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion is a big release so when the embargo date lifted last Sunday everybody's review went up at the same time some people midnight they had that review out other people waited till various times uh, some people did it the next day but you so what happens is there's a huge amount of reviews that come out for that it works really well as a publicity for that company to have a whole power of reviews especially if they're positive um, and they probably are going to be uh, but for a smaller game it's not going to get that wave of reviews. So if some company with some little dice game says, well, Tom, you can't review this game till July 3rd, I'd be like, okay, sure. And maybe I'll review it August. You know, just it just happens to be when it is. An embargo date can't make me review it on that date unless it's a big enough game, then the excitement's there. Now for an embargo date to work properly, they, you want to get the game in advance. So for example, a Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, we got it almost a month ahead of the embargo date, quite early enough that we were able to play it casually, leisurely, get the game played and put it together. This is a positive thing of embargo dates because there's no rush to get it out early and uh, getting the reviews out early, it's not so much an effect on us because most of the time people are going to watch our shows anyway or other people like shut up and sit down, you know, it doesn't affect them. But for a small reviewer, an embargo date and if you get the, if you know, if, you, if there's no embargo date, you, you want to get that game and you might play it that night and put the review out the next day. But this gives people the uh, at least hopefully more thoughtful reviews. Again, if you get it early enough. I've gotten games before where the game showed up and they're like, the embargo date is tomorrow. Oh, okay. Well, there might as well be no embargo date at that point. You know, I don't know that I can flip the game that fast enough to play it and review it, which most likely won't happen. So, to, to, to uh, sum up here, at least in this part, uh, embargo dates only work really, are only really important if the game is a big, splashy game. They also really only work if you get the game far enough in advance to give it a thorough playing through. Um, now, embargo dates can make it seem, and this is something I struggle with as a reviewer, can make it seem like you're working for the company. We're reviewers, right? I'm not a company's publicist. To the point where if a company says, we need a review up on a certain day, I push back. Several companies have done this to me in the past. Board game companies will say, we need this between these two dates. And I have always pushed back on that because I don't work for them. Um, and fortunately, the Dice Tower is big enough where I can kind of flex my muscles there a little bit. And some companies then don't send me the games for that reason. They're like, well, if you can't guarantee a review, we're not going to send it. And... The problem for me there is, and I, you know, it's, that's fine, it's the company's rights to not send me the games, but the problem therein lies, it's almost also, and every company is very clear to say, it doesn't need to be a positive review, but you still kind of get the idea that if it's not positive, maybe it won't come next time. Or the excitement of getting a game that no one else has can lead you to that idea of, oh man, this is exciting, and you just tend to be a little bit more excited about it. Now. I want to be clear, I'm not accusing anyone of anything at all. I don't think the companies are being nefarious. I don't think the other reviewers are being nefarious. But this is something that could happen because of embargo dates. What do I think overall? I think embargo dates are fine. They work for me when I get one from a company. We'll follow it to the letter. I will not put up the review before that date. 
Sometimes I'll wait a day on purpose just to make sure that I got my time zones right and what does it really matter anyway? What's the difference between one day? I, you know, there's another whole topic we can talk about between when the game is reviewed and when the game is released. Well, I'll talk about that in the future. But I just thought this was an interesting thing. It's, it's happening more and more. I'm definitely getting more and more embargo dates as time goes by. But I'm enjoying, I, I'm enjoying, like I said, if I get the game early enough, I can play it a lot before we release it. And that has happened, and it's happening more and more. For all you know, I might have a hot game I'm sitting on right now and playing, and there could be an embargo in the future. Is it true? I don't know. Who knows? Um, but that also depends on the relationship between the reviewer and the consumer. So I've seen some negative stuff, people talking about, that I don't like all these reviews being released at the same time. But that's just a natural byproduct, and I don't think that's bad. Yes, you can't watch all of them. Yes, it looks like a publicity thing, but also, hopefully, people will give you their honest opinion. Yes, I got Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion early. I loved it. I gave it a 10 out of 10. But that has nothing to do with the fact that it was an embargo date and I got it early. Because I get a lot of games early, and I have a lot of embargo dates, and they're not always gushing reviews in that regard. So what do you think about it? What are your thoughts on this? Maybe there's some publishers out there. What are your thoughts on it? Or other reviewers, you know, I'm always interested to hear from you. But as a whole, I think they're good. Um, they actually help smaller reviewers. Um, I don't mean people who are way less than me. Um, but, you know, reviewers with fewer things, more than us. Of course, I always use big because I don't think Dice Tower is big. But they help the smaller reviewers more because it puts everyone at an even level. And I'm okay with that. I think that's perfectly fine. But I think that it also gives us that extra time to play, extra time to think about the game, and it also gives people a chance to look at a game while it's hot and then go on to maybe the next game or read more about it. All right, let's keep going. Welcome to Survey Says, where we survey you listeners and we discuss the results. We are the Board Game Weekenders. I'm Steven. And I'm Colby. In this week's episode, we asked, how many unplayed board games are in your collection? We had 40 responses for this survey, and 14 being the highest for 0 to 5 unplayed board games in your collection, which I'm, for one, I'm glad that this is the highest result, because that means people are being diligent about getting those unplayed games off their shelf, which, unlike me, I'm more in the 11 to 20 range, I think, unfortunately. Yeah, I try to keep mine at zero to five, but I'm at around six to ten right now. And I, I do think that not being able to play games as much as I have the past few months has affected that because I've bought a couple. I've gotten a few Kickstarters in. Um, the 11 to 20 range and 20 plus range are very close. And I'm curious if that is people in a similar circumstance yeah. or is it they bought a game and their intention on that was collecting it and never playing that game yeah another thing um that i was thinking about is uh online board game sales and sales at stores and things might affect this too a little bit where you might have kind of peaks and lows just depending on sales of board games as well and there was somebody who commented on facebook about somebody with a larger collection who only has 20 games unplayed is a lot lower percentage of somebody who has, say, 10 games and five of them are unplayed. Yeah, so, yeah, that would, that would come into effect, and that would be an interesting uh, poll in the future. Thanks for checking out this week's episode. Let us know your thoughts on the results in the comments below. Look out for next week's survey on Twitter at BG Weekenders. And make sure to tune in to the next episode of Survey Says. Action! What year is it? Cut! Action! Action! What year is it? Cut! I can't believe I grew my hair and my beard out for this gag. All Dad had to do was say the year. You know your father. All done. I feel so much better. Here I have Jumanji, published in 1995 by Milton Bradley. This is a two to four player game where you're trying to escape the jungle. Let me set this up and show you how it works. This is what the game board will look like set up. Everybody's going to pick a different color pawn and it's going to start on their own color. Everybody also is going to get a rescue die. On every player's turn, you're going to roll an eight-sided dice and move 
that many numbers along your path here. If you land on a blank space, that means that you're going to draw a card and then follow its directions. You will do that by putting it into the secret decoder. It'll give you a symbol that the other players need to roll and the bonus on how many spaces they will move if they are successful. The player who drew the card will be the timekeeper. Now he will flip over the timer and everybody will start rolling their rescue dice. And the object of everybody else will be to roll a racket to go ahead and save you from the spiders. If everybody rolls the racket, they are, everybody else will move ahead one space as a bonus for rescuing you. If the players fail to roll the racket, you are going to have to take the penalty by moving one space backwards. And then the card will go over here on the doomsday track. If at any time the doomsday track gets filled up with the last card, everybody will lose the game. If you land here on a rhino space, you can move the rhino to any other rhino space to try to block another player. If you land here on a wait for five or eight, that means that the next player will roll the dice and if he gets a five or eight, you are safe. But if he doesn't get a five or eight, you will move back one space. Then it's the next player's turn to try to roll a five or eight. If that player didn't roll a five or eight, you'll move back another space. So you're waiting for somebody to roll a five or eight. The object of the game is to come all the way over here to the Jumanji space first. Whoever does that will win the game. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the original Jumanji movie starring the late Robin Williams, another one of my favorite movies. Well, that's all the time I have for now. If you have a comment, comment below, or you can tweet it to me at RetroBoardGamer. And as always, may your rolls be high. 2020. Alrighty, folks. Well, that's that. Thanks for watching another Board Game Breakfast at Dice Tower Summer Spectacular starts Tuesday, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be making some announcements about the Dice Tower, some cool things. There's even a cool... Well, I can't even tell you. You'll just have to wait and see. It's going to be a lot of fun this week. I hope you enjoy yourself. Thanks for watching again. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. You've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks to Panda Sars. Enter the Sonara Contest that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. We'll announce the winners next week. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.